America is dropping like a stone in rankings of freedom. As power accumulates in one person, expect that to continue. Hi, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer for Reason TV, and today we're here with Frank Buckley. He's a professor at the law school at George Mason University and the author of the new book, The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government. Frank, thanks for coming in. Tracy, thanks for having me. You spend a lot of time in the book on the growing power of the presidency and how this uh, evolved over the years. So can you talk about how you liken this to crown government and some examples from the Obama administration compared to his predecessors? We have evolved into a new kind of constitution and it's a constitution that resembles that of George III in England before the revolution. And the revolution was all about how we didn't like that, but now we've evolved towards a regime in which power is increasingly held by one person, the president, and that makes him something like an elective monarch. That's what George Mason called him, and he said an elective monarchy is worse than the real thing. An elective monarch has the legitimacy conferred by a democratic election, and a king, a hereditary king, doesn't have that. Can you talk about how, yeah, if this absolutely. has been more of a gradual process or if it's really shown up more in recent years? Well, it's been a gradual process in which power has been concentrated in the executive branch and it got a quantum change in the last couple of years with President Obama. Now, I don't want to say he's the only person who's done it, but in the last couple of years, increasingly, he makes laws by diktat. He doesn't enforce the laws he doesn't like. He has a huge spending power, and the greatest of all powers, whether to go to war or not, rests largely simply with the president. Mm -hmm. And if that's not a monarchy, I'm not quite sure what is a monarchy. You say that the founders' initial intention was not to have a popularly elected president. So we have one version of what the framers were all about, which is separation of powers. I don't think that's quite accurate. I think they were chiefly concerned to ensure that power would be diffused and not held by one person. A parliamentary regime was more or less what the framers wanted. They thought that in nearly all cases, the president would be chosen by the House of Representatives, voting by state. The last time that happened was 1824. It could happen again conceivably. It nearly happened in 2000. But they thought that's the way it would work, and that's how parliaments work. It, the House of Commons chooses the prime minister. They thought the House of Representatives would choose the president. Why did that not happen? Because of things that the framers didn't anticipate. We have a modern media, we have national candidates, we have the rise of democracy. None of these things were things the framers anticipated. And just going back to your other point on separation of powers, um, you know, something that's ingrained in students as they grow up is how important checks and balances are. As far as the separation of powers is concerned, right now Obama, or a president, has slipped off many of the constraints and instead of a device to constrain a president, it's one which immunizes him from criticism by Congress. You see, the president is the only person elected by the country at large, whereas the leader of the House of Representatives is elected from someplace in Ohio you never heard of. You've got one person in the White House of whom the media has made a rock star, and you have 435 fractious people in Congress uh, led by, as I say, somebody who comes from someplace you never heard of, and it's no contest. So when Obama acts in ways people say are unconstitutional, generally Congress simply lies on its back and, and uh, kicks its feet up and waits for a tummy rub from the president. The executive branch, you say, actually employs two and a half million people. Can you break down that number for us and why that leads to more regulation? This is not counting people in the military, by the way, so it's it's all of the people in the executive branch, and that includes the departments and the czars and the political appointees. None of this is really subject to the control of Congress. So the czars, for example, are appointed by the president without uh, approval of Congress, and the cabinet itself is, is a bit player. Cabinet meetings are meetings where the president tells the cabinet, here's the plan, get with it, and uh, it's really the czars that, that run things. And that's not surprising. That's the story of the entire first world. But the difference in other countries is where you have a parliamentary regime, you have a prime minister who's accountable to the House of Commons, and he has to stand up in front of them. And I want to say this is something that people should be worried about generally, and perhaps libertarians in particular, because 
The rise of Crown government, as I call it, is, I think, the underlying cause of many of the symptoms that people might object to. Presidential governments are bad for liberty as an empirical matter. Parliamentary countries are freer. America is dropping like a stone in rankings of freedom. As power accumulates in one person, expect that to continue. Well, Frank, thanks again for coming to talk about your book. Thanks so much. For Reason TV, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer.